Oh, thank you so much. Well, what's up? Uh, good morning. <laughs> Sorry, I was speaking a different language. All right, so uh, my name is Brian Douglas. I go by B-Dougie on the internet, and uh, I'm super honored to be here on this stage uh, delivering a keynote. Uh, I've actually been coding for professionally for almost 10 years, and uh, it's crazy that this conference has been around for 10 years as well, uh, which we'll get in, the, in a bit. But I'm going to talk about insights and open source projects. It's, uh, it's been a passion project for me for a long time. Actually, on this stage for a five-minute lightning talk uh, back in 2019, I actually announced this project uh, to a very small room. It was a lightning talk during lunch. Um, but yeah, I've been working on it since and happy to share more. Um, but what, why I know I've been programming for almost 10 years is because I have a nine-year-old. And my nine-year-old, when he was born, uh, he was born 11 weeks early, in the hospital, I learned how to use Ruby on Rails. Uh, Ruby on Rails is open source Ruby framework. And uh, always wanted to build an app, add a computer to the house. Actually, no PHP, and did a little bit of Perl, but never saw myself as an engineer or as a, I could get a job in the industry. Um, so super honored to be here because this conference is, uh, I know there's been like a lot of partnerships with the local colleges and universities uh, in the area. Um, shout out to Shaw University. I saw the sign for Shaw on the way in, um, HBCU, and yeah, just happy to be here. But, oh, sorry, go ahead and clap. <laughs> Please clap. Yeah, so earlier this year, my son was, uh, he stayed home from school, and uh, so he's nine years old, and he was like sick, but he really just wanted to play Roblox. So my, what my wife did is uh, she bought this book, which is about black inventors, and she made him like, read the book and do a, a paragraph on what he learned. And I thought it was a great idea. Honestly, I didn't even think about doing stuff like that. Usually I'm just like, cool, play Roblox, I've got meetings. Uh, but it was just me and him in the house all day and he went through this book. And uh, super honored that he's like super excited to see other folks uh, in the industry that look like me as well. So like I'm not the only nerd that he knows in the house. Um, it's funny because the uh, in this book they have the, uh, the black females who shit, uh, sent the, the rocket into space. When he learned about that when he was seven years old, he called them the first computers, first black computers, because he didn't understand computer scientists and the difference, so he's like, oh yeah, the first black computer sent the rocket into space. And I thought that was really cute. <laughs> but I bring this up because in that book, there was um, this guy called Booker T. Washington. A lot of us learned about Booker T. Washington in school during Black History Month. And, uh, Booker T. Washington did a lot of really awesome stuff, like the Tuskegee Institute, um, all the sort of black businesses that were early at the turn of the century, post uh, antebellum. So uh, I didn't know a lot about this until later, like after reading books like this. And uh, Booker T. Washington started one of the first HBCUs in the country in Virginia called Hampton University. Um, this HBCU was specifically set in place for black individuals post slavery to get involved in the workforce, so uh, you, it really just sort of was hospitality, uh, working in the different areas of industry that they were allowed to work in, because uh, that's basically, that was the ceiling that we had to work through. Um, but what's interesting about this like HPCU concept is it gave folks access to integrate in society. And like when I look at this room, I, I see a lot of folks that look like me, uh, I see a lot of folks who don't look like me, and I'm super honored that there's so many other institutions, uh, accelerators, boot camps, that are ushering new faces into the industry. Uh, so I just wanted to bring that up because I'm a big fan of open source and I think open source is a really good gateway into getting more folks in the industry because uh, there's no barrier. The only barrier is access and it could be a computer, it could be friendship, it could be a conference uh, and that's, that's what I've been actually trying to push for, for since I've joined the industry uh, almost 10 years ago. So um, I also want to mention All In, I know they got an award yesterday, but I'm super honored to also be a part of the All In Open Source program as well. I, my former employer at GitHub, yes, please, please clap. So my former employer was GitHub. I worked there for four and a half years on the DevRel team, and uh, I, was part, I was in the room on conceiving um, this platform. We also, we did consult with MLH as well to find out how we can teach HBCU students that are doing CS and CE, how to do open source, because I think there's a big disconnect. A lot of people don't know that Spelman College, based out of Atlanta, uh, one of like the top 10 biggest HBCUs in the uh, country, they don't have a, a, their own CS program. Their program is actually gifted to them from Georgia Tech. So like, there's a lot of distance between access and privilege, 
uh, and a lot of different colleges. Like North Carolina has one of the biggest HBCUs in the entire country. And uh, like there's so much opportunity here. And like I'd love to see more of all in open source getting connected to folks like MLH and uh, all things open. And I uh, just want to bring the shout that out again as well. Cool, so I mentioned I got into programming about 10 years ago. Uh, I got my first open source contribution about five, uh, well, 2015, so math is hard, eight years, seven years. So I didn't know how, I, I learned Ruby on Rails. I didn't know how to do server-side JavaScript. I had a problem that I was trying to solve where we were trying to include folks into our Slack channel through automation, through our cron, and uh, server-side JavaScript with webhooks was the way that I learned through Stack Overflow to do it. And the challenge I had was I didn't know how to do that. So. Uh, found a GitHub repo on GitHub. Uh, I unfortunately did not know how to use GitHub properly at the time. So instead of opening up a GitHub issue, I emailed the maintainer. And uh, if, if you're new in open source, uh, probably don't do that. Uh, I guess DMs are cool, uh, but emails are awkward. But to my surprise, this maintainer was actually super friendly. It was like a Friday night. I was like, hey, I have to do this thing by Monday. Um, I don't have to use this thing, can you help me? And uh, to my surprise, he responded. And the reason he responded uh, throughout the entire weekend was because he was based in Thailand. But when I was working late nights, it was like his normal morning. So I was like, oh wow, I just super got, I got lucky on that one. And, uh, and then he also announced, he's like, hey, I'm glad it worked for you. By the way, I'm actually traveling in Thailand at a K-pop concert. And to my surprise, I had no idea what K-pop was. I didn't know what a digital nomad was as well. It's like super brand new, junior in the industry. And, um, from that point on, like I, I say from stage here, my DMs are always open because if someone can actually mentor me and bring me in the industry and do like do open source with them and show me the ropes, uh, I want to do the same for anybody. So, then right now, DMs open if anyone's getting started. Um, I, it sounds like it's going to be like ten dollars per DM pretty soon, thanks to Elon. But until it costs ten dollars, DMs are open. Cool. So uh, this. These numbers have been shared multiple times throughout this conference. Uh, the summary here on the slide is that open source is super valuable for hiring. Um, the number 90% of the demand for open source and, and talent acquisition, is it's like off the charts. But the unfortunate like, reality is most people don't know this is a, a way to get access in the industry. Uh, I worked at GitHub. I know engineers who came through Electron. Electron started at GitHub. And I know college students who contributed to Electron and got a full-time job. And that same college student I'm thinking about is now a staff engineer at GitHub uh, five years later because they had access and privilege and opportunity. And uh, what I'm getting at is like, I, and this, I, I didn't really set this slide up well, but I built Open Source, which is the project I'm gonna talk about in a sec, based on this quote. So Gucci Mane is the godfather of trap music based at Atlanta, East Atlanta, Santa. And uh, back in the late 2000s, when I was in college, he had this interview on Tumblr uh, asking about how do you find the sauce? Uh, and this is all tug in cheek, but like the actual response is actually something that I've been living by when it comes to open source. Because if you don't got sauce, then you lost. And I think there's a lot of folks who don't know what's in the sauce, or don't even know the sauce exists. Like you can get your CS degree, get your degree, become a manager, maybe a founder or whatever. Um, but there's, so, there's a whole other opportunity. And like, PHP being around for so long and getting a word from MLH, like that was a, a gateway for so many new developers to start writing code uh, and start building software and building entire companies like Meta, Facebook. So uh, I bring that up because uh, open source is the thing I'll talk about in a moment. And uh, it is really was a self-serve project for me to maintain my own open source. So it was a CRM tool for me to manage my contributions. And back in 2020, during the pandemic, someone actually reached out and was like, hey, why don't you add a log into this? Like, I'd love to manage my own open source projects as well. And uh, to my surprise, people started signing up for that. So I uh, spent the last couple years sort of bootstrapping, doing this for fun on the side. And um, I've, I've grown myself as a caricature in the internet uh, where I'm the Beyonce of open source. And I, I truly believe this. I know it's, it's tug in cheek, but I think Beyonce has a huge super fan group. And I think if I can help usher in more folks, or maybe even other folks can be Beyonce's of open source, we can usher more folks into the industry uh, through our own special way. Cool, so I start off with this like one question, how do I get involved in open source? Like there's a lot of good guides out there, opensource.guide, um, I was running a program called Open Source Friday at GitHub for a long time, and there's a lot of really good first steps, but like once you find that repository, it's always very confusing on where to start. 
You don't know who to talk to. You don't know where to make your first contribution. And it's good that we have good first issues, but again, if you don't have so if you don't got the sauce, then you lost. So you got to move past the good first issue. Um, so I, I enjoy every year during October. There's Hacktoberfest. Uh, how many of you did a PR or signed up for Hacktoberfest this year? Cool, a handful of us, which is good. Maybe you all are experts in the room, uh, but this is a really good gateway for folks to get the exposure. So even this note of open source exists as a as a, a platform. Also, this is a great way to learn not to email maintainers instead open a GitHub issue. So during Hacktoberfest, open source has always been a side drop project for me. Uh, I developed this concept, well, I didn't develop the concept. I actually took this concept from Express. Uh, Express.js being a server-side JavaScript, the thing I didn't know how to use. Uh, they have this thing called the triage team. And the triage team is really meant to triage issues. Uh, it's a painful process. I was talking to Next.js a couple years ago, uh, which is the React meta framework. Uh, they were getting 100 issues a day. So just that feat alone to manage all those issues, it's a lot of work. But what if we could train the next level or the next up and coming generation to manage the triaging of issues through labeling? Uh, this re requires opting in folks into the program or into the organization, but also it's a bit of training. So I've got a triage guide inside of my project. I'd encourage you if you do any sort of triaging and maybe it's overwhelming, invite the next generation to come help you label issues. It sounds super tedious, but I started my, I got my teeth cut doing Ruby on Rails and doing CSS and jQuery. Like that seemed tedious once I learned that there was more stuff to do. So someone's gotta start somewhere and I encourage you, look in the triage teams. Uh, this is a, a copy of the triage guide. We don't have time to, to read that. Uh, the other thing I do is um, I started this uh, back in 2018. I had this idea, uh, we got a lot of sort of transient uh, issues open and PRs open inside of our projects. Some of them were valid, some of them were invalid or spam. And in order to combat against that, but also train the next generation up, is we created this automation through GitHub Actions to enforce people to link issues. Uh, and obviously this is GitHub specific, so obviously uh, take this knowledge to whatever you're using. Uh, but we created this GitHub Action to force folks to add a linked issue onto your PR. Because uh, it's, it's good to get the code, but if you have no idea why the code exists or who you are or where this came from, I force everyone to open up an issue first it sounds really tedious, but then it teaches someone how to like, explain why they wrote the code, where it came from, what they were trying, trying to do. Uh, so if you didn't know about this on GitHub, uh, you can link issues uh, just by doing a pound sign and the, number, the issue number, uh, and that's enforced through this thing called our PR compliance GitHub action. So shout out to MT Foley, who's actually, who lives in Raleigh. Uh, he's not at this event because he's working. Uh, but the good thing about this is MT Foley was actually a contributor to open source. Uh, so Matt is a specifically his, his first name. Uh, he was working on air conditioning software, like super old, archaic software. Uh, he had, a, I think maybe did computer engineering previously, but he wanted to get into web development. But there was no pathway from air conditioning software <laughs> to web development. And he found open source, actually I was on a podcast, and he reached out, he's like, hey, I wanna get involved. He's like, oh cool, I got a good first issue. Uh, mind you, I've said this once and I'll move on, the best good first issue is the one you open. Um, a lot of folks always spend all the time trying to find good first issues or trying to find their first contribution. The best thing I can do for someone who wants to contribute to my project is show them how to open that issue and show them how to fix it. Every good first issue in open source has the answer in the issue. Uh, it's, it's by default because I don't think anybody should have to try hard to join a community if it's gonna be through contributions or through labeling issues. I wanna lower the barrier because I know what barrier I had to, uh, to basically get across. Like I, my first time, my first job, I was 27 years old. Uh, I'd spent my a whole nother career working in sales and doing stuff I thought I was supposed to do while I wanted to do full-time engineering. Um, so I just wanna make the barrier super, super low for folks. So I go through that, just quick examples, but then I wanna talk about these insights because what, what I'm working on right now is I wanna be able to walk into any project no matter where it's hosted and identify, is this a project I can contribute to? So we put together this project, uh, starting June, I had left GitHub to work on this full time. Uh, and this insights platform, insights.opensauce.pizza, is the actual URL. Uh, we built this platform in, in partnership with DigitalOcean and Hacktoberfest to identify all insights across 527,000 PRs uh, since October 1st. Um, it was a, a, a pretty big feat and also very expensive, but luckily DigitalOcean, thank you so much for the free credits. Uh, we're now able to identify things like spam, uh, things like acceptance rates for PRs, which is, it's valid. We, we're not really trying to push PRs to get merged in a certain amount of time, 
But if I'm going to contribute the first time, like I want to walk in just like I'm going to walk into the barbecue spot. Um, I think it's called the pit around the back this afternoon. See you there. I'm going to look at a Yelp review before I walk in. Uh, I'm not trying to do reviews for, pe for projects, but I just want to give people a, a fighting chance to get involved in a community. And there, if there are communities that have really good infrastructure and a really good organization or a maintainer team, uh, I want to point people to that. So I spent my entire time working at open source trying to find good projects to work on. Now I'm reaching out to projects and trying to set them up for success. Uh, so real quick, not only can we show contribution distribution of, of PRs, but we also see down to the contributor level. Uh, so we're going to be doing some pretty cool things early next year around individual contributors and profiles uh, to identify where they're making contributions so other people can follow along and then also maybe make contributions on places that are onboarding contributors pretty well. Uh, so the slide meant to be earlier, but contribution distribution. And this is also like, I, I spent the last four and a half years working at GitHub and identifying like, there's, there's an insights tab on GitHub, but it's pretty underwhelming to be quite honest. Shout out to GitHub, but it is, it is pretty underwhelming. Uh, I could see who's contributing the project, but it could have been someone contributing from years ago. Uh, I know the, the Redis project, which I know they have representation. I know their creator and main maintainer left the project last year. I don't know that as a new contributor. I know Redis. I know I can walk into the uh, uh, contributor graph and see them, but I don't know that if I should reach out to them and email them, or should I email somebody else in the project? There's not really a good onboard path into reaching out and saying, hey, I can help. And the, the sad part is like a lot of folks have years in the experience and can't do open source because they don't know where to start. Um, so the contributor graph, I don't know if everybody knows this, but you can actually zoom in specifically to a certain section inside of GitHub to see where contributions are. So uh, that one's for free. But this is uh, currently the Vite project. Uh, Vite is a uh, build tool uh, in the JavaScript ecosystem. I'm able to narrow it down to see where contributions are specifically. And if I see someone who's making lots of contributions, I have an opportunity to reach out in the Discord because they have a Discord to have that conversation. But this all insights uh, on GitHub, having orange blobs and seeing like where activity looks like, I've always wanted to see a deeper dive and a deeper level into to what's happening. So currently in open source, like our chart that I showed earlier, it's all based on 30 days of activity. Uh, by default, we'll probably do more deep dives in the, in the future based on infrastructure costs. Uh, but I wanted to, I'm looking at the Next.js project right now, and I want to see like contributions within the last 30 days. Uh, and something that I always see is uh, something which is um, called bus factor. The bus factor being if you got on a bus and you never came back, uh, how detrimental that'd be for the project. And consistently, I see this in a lot of projects. You'll see a lot of performance upgrades. You'll want to see a lot of transfers from Webpack to Vite or something similar where they touch a lot of files. And that becomes something that whenever I was, I was managing at GitHub, whenever I see that, it becomes an opportunity for me to say, hey, thanks so much for your contribution, but could you also do docs along with that? Or, hey, you're doing a lot of work here. Do you think you could spread the wealth or spread the contributions to other folks? Um, so my intent here is I want to give a fighting chance to anybody who walks in the project to say, hey, you know what, this person's like crushing it. Maybe not the best mentor, but maybe this person can help mentor through docs or mentor through a quick call or maybe recorded content. So uh, I'm setting up this whole infrastructure to be basically to have that question for anybody to walk to any project and do this. The other thing I want to mention is that we have currently file level changes. So it's hard to find out who the maintainer, or who's the owner of the project. And we want to be able to generate code owners uh, by default for any project based on contribution. And I also want to point out that this is based on code contributions. I do understand that there's non-code contributions. Um, that's a larger problem and a larger thing to, like we're a very small team, uh, so we'll get there eventually, but currently we're working on code contributions. Um, so I'll, I'll sort of skim through this a bit to, to get to the end, but I just wanted to just bring up, having context and contributions gives everyone a leg up. Like it gives everyone a leg up to be able to understand like what's happening, where churn is happening. A lot of times you get co contributors uh, so Matt's a contributor who's been, he, he got his first full-time React job through contributions to open source. He hasn't contributed a lot since because I think it's also, it's, it's valid to be able to roll off a project. Like I'm super proud of what he's contributed into the project I've been working on, but he also got an awesome job at SRS here in, in Raleigh. So I think he needs to focus on that and grow his career and become that senior dev, the staff engineer, and he can always come back and hang out. Um, which I'm looking forward to hanging out with Matt tonight. But so what I'm getting at is like getting an idea of like contributions between not just the orange blob on GitHub, 
but actually seeing what PRs are changed, you get a good understanding of what's happening in the project. So look forward to sharing more about this in the future. The other thing I wanted to point out is the context. You know, I, we're doing like some heuristics to find out changes, whether they're new features, maintenance changes, or, um, well, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm blanking, refactoring as well. Like these are all different types of changes that take different types of skill set. Someone who could touch 20 files in one PR is a different person than can write tests for the project. Uh, maybe it's the same person, but it's a different skill set um, that folks can develop in different areas. So depending on the need of the project, you might need some refactoring. You might need some and then testing. Highly recommend uh, approaching it that way. Uh, so at the end of the day, like, I think we should evolve. I think every, most of us are evolving past the green square thing. Uh, we can be more than green squares. We can be more to basically invite other folks into the industry and give them a pathway and a fighting chance to make their first contribution. So uh, I would love to talk more about this. Find me around. Actually, I'm giving a talk in the afternoon on GitHub Actions and how we automate this process. Uh, so automating deployments and also how we crawl GitHub as well. We're using GitHub Actions as well. Uh, so definitely hit us up. Also, if you're interested in finding out how other people got their first contribution in the industry or how they founded a company on open source, I've been doing this uh, podcast called The Secret Sauce, where I've specifically been reaching out to folks. Uh, so Catherine got her job at GitHub because of an open source project. Catherine's all the way on the right. Uh, built an open source project post boot camp, and uh, that open source project got tweeted out by GitHub once, uh, once we found out. So it was my team that tweeted it out. And then within a week, she had an interview with the director of engineering at GitHub. So past performance is not predictor of future growth. But I, I think that putting yourself out there and doing open source and being involved in the community is a really good way to get a leg up. Cool. So um, that's all my slides of Beyonce of open source. And uh, thank you so much for, for listening. And uh, stay saucy. Good morning. And thank you very much for showing up here. Um, this is the month of November, and as they say, no shave November, okay? So check out my profile pic in a few days. It's going to be a dense handlebar. Um, and the idea of that handlebar is if you are a man or there is a man in your life, brother, husband, father, friend, colleague, tell them it's more important to be playing with you, talking to you, as opposed to being hung on a family wall. So. It's important to get your medical checkup done, is make sure that you're doing the right things you know, to stay healthy and eat healthy and stay healthy. So I think that's an important element. And it's like somebody took the HDMI cable out. I think that needs to be plugged in. Voila. All right. Now, this is a topic that is very near and dear to my heart. Now, well, once the slide shows up. They're showing up here, but not up here. Um, Non-technical skills eat technical skills for breakfast. What does it mean? You know, well, technical skills are technical. Java developer, Go developer, Kubernetes developer. Uh, Non-technical skills on the other side shows your human nature. And that's sort of the main difference over here. Um, your team may be the most talented technical team, but these non-technical skills are really a force multiplier for your team. Your team has all the talented rock star speakers or developers, but they're lacking the non-technical skills. The likelihood of succeeding is sort of low. Multiple studies have been done around that. Um, so I'm hoping that in this talk, uh, I will share some personal stories. Hopefully, you'll connect with them. Nice picture, right? So we all hope and wish we work like this sitting you know, by the beach, enjoying a lovely view on my laptop by myself, and not interacting with anybody. Not a reality. In general, you know, we are always working in a team. In an open source world, all the more with a globally diverse team, with people that have very different viewpoints. And your project that you're working on needs to be integrated with somebody else's project. You know, you're probably one part of the solution which needs to be integrated with others. How do you communicate? You know, is having technical skill sufficient? Not really. That's where your non-technical skills come on. So I'll talk about what are non-technical skills and why they are needed. Well, let's talk about where this terminology, non-technical skills, also called as interpersonal skills or soft skills, where this terminology comes from. 
This actually goes back to 1960s. Uh, U.S. Army had multiple battalions that were fighting a war. All of these battalions were given the exact same hard skills, which is the machinery skills. But the battalions that were winning were the ones that were not just utilizing the hard skills, but actually non-hard skills because the way they were being led. So U.S. Army called this term as soft skills. Now, the term soft has a bit of a negative connotation that, oh, they are soft, optional, not really required. But actually, it showed that the teams or the battalions that were using those soft skills were winning the war. I think it's very, very important and fundamental that these soft skills are required. So what are non-technical skills? And as I said, you know, the technical skills is your technical ability, non-technical skills show the personality of your side. Um, these skills are also known as people skills or interpersonal skills, shows how you interact with your team. How do you do the discussion with your team? How do you interact with your team? Um, in, you might have heard the quote which says, Peter Drucker's quote, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Let me repeat that. Culture eats strategy for breakfast. No matter how good or solid your strategy is, if the company doesn't have the right culture, it's going to kill the strategy. And these non-technical skills are the ones that define the culture of your team. It's really important if you want to be successful, you bring that culture in. And I'm going to talk about what some of those skills are that is going to be essential. Now, over the years, you know, I've changed a few jobs. And I've worked at pretty decent-sized companies, actually. And every time I have changed the job, now, all of these companies have had very good technical abilities. But every time I've changed a job, um, technical skills have never been the reason. It's always been the non-technical skills. And I've been fortunate in that sense that right about the time when I'm realizing, you know what, my non-technical skills are not getting utilized, somebody came and picked me up and said, hey, come work for me. They made an offer I couldn't refuse. And voila, you move on. So non-technical skills are super important. Now. Um, as I talked about, they really show your personality on who you are. It's an important part of it. And as I said, they are soft skills, but really hard to acquire because it truly is what your personality is. If I were to summarize, you know, what is the difference between technical and non-technical? Technical skills is what we know, and non-technical skills are who we are. That's really, you know, and as a human being, you bring a combination of both of those together at your work. Let's take a look at Netflix job culture. It talks about they don't allow brilliant jerks. And if you think about that quote, really, brilliant is what we know, and jerks are who we are. They don't allow brilliant jerks. I will take it. You know, I don't allow brilliant jerks in my team. I am challenging myself. Hey, I'm being a jerk. If I'm being a jerk, back off. Think about it. So, Forbes did a study of the 10 most in-demand skills that are required for the next 10 years. And these are the results that came out of it. Guess what? Out of these 10 skills, eight are non-technical skills or soft skills. Really, really important for you to be successful in your life, in your career, in your personal life. This is the way to grow. So um, I'll share these slides. You know, I'll post, the, post them on my Twitter. I'm sure Todd will include them as well. Some of you may recognize this, you know, particularly people from the Indian origin. This is a very classic actor back from 1960s. His name is Dev Anand. The first skill, well, in my keynote, I'm going to talk about only one skill. But the way this skill comes about is summarizes very well by a Hindi song by this actor. So I'm going to sing that song for about 15 seconds. I will do the translation of the song, and then I'll get into the skill. The song goes like this. Jo mil gaya, usi ko mukaddar samaj liya. Jo kho gaya, main usko bhulata chala gaya. That's a song in Hindi, and the translation of that song means is, whatever I get in my life is my destination, and whatever I don't get I forget about it and move on. And that, to me, is the summary of how we should see things. 
it brings a lot of mindfulness in what you have. And nobody better than Todd Lewis, you know, who impersonates this gratitude. Really, I have four skills that I want to talk about, but in the keynote, there is only so much time. So I'm going to talk about kindness and gratitude. I think this is one of the skills that we don't talk about enough. Why it is such an important non-technical skill that we each need to have. It is super important. There are lots of benefits around kindness and gratitude. What is kindness? Kindness is basically a act of helping or complimenting somebody without expecting anything in return. And gratitude on the other side is a thankful appreciation of an act of kindness. Kindness could be anything. You know, it could mean complimenting somebody, hey, your shoes are looking good, your shirt is looking nice, the blue color on you suits very well. Helping your colleague at work with you know, submitting a PR. You know, as Brian was talking about, helping somebody mentor in their open source career, lots of different ways. Now, think about the impact of that. What happens is, the person that you complimented with a blue shirt, you made their day happy. All day, they are peppy that, hey, you know what, I'm looking good. You know, and that gives them a good feeling. So it's very important that all it takes is 10 seconds, maybe a couple of minutes. Let the lady on the crosswalk cross, as opposed to just honking at her that, hey, I got to go rush. All it takes is 10 seconds, but it really brings a lot of calmness and kindness in the world. I think one thing that the world needs more and more is kindness, not just for our work, but in our teams, at our work, and everywhere else. So it's not hard. Let's go make the world a kinder place. Let's see what kindness and gratitude gives us. As it says, you know, an act of kindness releases a hormone called as serotonin. Now, serotonin, you know, generates a feeling of calmness and can even boost your self-esteem. Uh, like most medical antidepressants, um, kindness stimulates the production of serotonin, and that really brings happiness to you. It also encourages the release of oxytocin, which is, um, encourages optimism, and uh, lowers your blood pressure and improves your cardiovascular health. You're seeing the positive side effects of the actual medical effects of bringing kindness. Um, the funny thing about kindness is, if you are being kind to somebody else, that person is getting the benefits, but your mind tricks you that you are also getting the benefit as well. And that's called as helper's high. You're helping somebody, but both of you are getting benefits and Oftentimes, people who are looking around you, if you help somebody out, they also get a high of it. So I think it's very important that how viral it is. And to me, honestly, having that kindness attitude at work really allows you to make that meaningful connection at work. Just being kind to somebody, just being helping out somebody, what goes around comes around. Now, and not that you're doing it because you want to be getting it back, but you're really doing it in a very selfless manner or being kind to other person in the team, at work, or wherever it is, okay? What goes down as part of kindness and gratitude? You know, uh, it, engaging in acts of kindness produces endorphins, which are brain's natural painkiller. So your pain level goes down. And it also shows that it helps you, um, it lowers your cortisol by 23% which reduces your stress level. So think about serotonin, oxytocin, helper's high, all going up, your pain and stress going down. Who doesn't want that? So just be very consciously aware of it and see how you want to do more and more of that. And by the way, um, November is the National Gratitude Month as well. Thanksgiving is coming. So let's make this as where you're doing one act of kindness every day, and be gratuitous person on what we get in life, and then enjoy it. This is a Gallup poll that was done, I, I believe, in 2018, and they looked at different generations on what they value at work. And if you look at this survey, they talk about the well-being is among the top two criteria for across all the generations. And well-being is not just physical well-being. It's very equally mental well-being as well. 
It's very important that employers are being part. Um, and then, you know, as your teammates, you are watching out for your workers on how you could make it a more kind and a gratuitous place. Random Act of Kindness, you know, is a nonprofit organization. Sometimes you think, how could I be kind? Well, this work poster actually gives you an idea. It's not that hard to be kind. You know, just simply giving a compliment, you know, just talking about, you know, how you are gratuitous towards everything. So this is just an idea of, you know, you can actually download this poster, put it at your workplace, um, go to randomactofkindness.org, put it in your team, you know, whatever, as a background poster so that people get inspired. Now, um, Brian, I think your son should talk to my son. Uh, he did an internship at Roblox this summer. Now, what he realized it is that you know, he did his internship. He's a junior at UPenn. And he was threatened to ask questions in the meeting that, oh, gosh, these people are so talented. He got an imposter syndrome. But how can I ask questions over there? And then the discussion I had with him is that, hey, you know, buddy, you're not being kind to yourself. If the questions are in your mind, and if you're not asking questions, how are you going to pick it up? So then he thought about it, and he made this quote. He says that others are not perfect, and I'm not fully flawed. So I'm going to go ahead, have the courage to ask the question, and learn from it. So that really allowed him to be kind to himself and really help him grow. And I'm sure we all connect with this quote by Maya Angelou. People will forget what you did, what you said to them. They will never forget how you made them feel. So independent of what you are doing with somebody, if you have been kind to them, if your acts are of kindness, and you are thankful to them, I think it really brings that meaningful connection at work. Because end of the day, that's all that matters. You know, if you do your best, and if you try to help out somebody, maybe the end result is like, hey, it didn't work out, but they will still remember you that, hey, you tried your best. I think that's the goal here. So really, what I want to do is I want to summarize this tip number four. I would really, really encourage, I would really challenge you to practice kindness at work, one kindness act of day, every day of month, every day of this month. This is a National Gratitude Month. Uh, at my team meetings uh, and my boss's team meeting, we always start with gratitude check-ins. So first few minutes of the meeting, all we are doing is, hey, let's talk about gratitude check-ins. We always wait for that. Oh, when that release is going to happen, then we're going to celebrate. When that release happens, we will celebrate. Let's enjoy our victories for the week. If somebody helped me out in the team, outside the team, we always do those gratitude check-ins. Those are super, super important because that kind of brings that camaraderie that we are enjoying the small victories on a regular basis. And then... At Intel, we have this concept of a spot recognition. So at any point of time, like, you know, if somebody helped me out with an event or I helped somebody out, we could send a spot recognition. And that recognition is actually in the form of dollars as well. We could have different levels of spot recognition. You kind of write a few lines that what did this person did to me, and you recognize them, and then the email goes to that person and their manager, and, you know, a few dollars are deposited into their account as well. So simple things doesn't cost a lot. You know, but really brings that meaningful connection at work, as I was talking about. So my point is, people skills are hard. Invest in them equally, because who you are and what you are, you bring your total self to the work. Now, just to kind of give you a sneak peek of my talk that I'm giving at 1245, I believe in developer two track. These are the different skills that I'll be talking about. Um, Communication. Um, a lot of the things in life are miserable because of lack of communication or misunderstanding of communication, so I'll talk about that. Last two years, if they have taught us anything, is about being adaptable. So I'll talk about adaptability, why that is an important skill. Um, conflict resolution, I'll talk about task conflict versus personality conflict and how we should resolve them. And of course, kindness and gratitude is super important. So, really, I just want to call out non-technical skills or soft skills or interpersonal skills are force multiplier for your technical skills. Technical skills are a basic requirement. On top of that, if your team has the right interpersonal skills, 
I think you are set up for a good success. Thank you. I'll be around. Please talk to me. So I want to tell everybody a story, and that story starts with my mom. This is Wendy. And from the day I was born, Wendy had a plan for me. And, you know, early on, everything was going pretty according to plan. I was well-behaved. I was a good student. I was adorable. Um, things were looking pretty good for my mom. You know, for proof, let's go to the mom cam. Uh, but every, every plan is bound to have some setbacks, right? And in the case of my mom's plan for me, the setbacks were significant. Um, let's go to the mom cam for an update. But, you know, despite everything, we pulled through. I graduated from high school, decent grades, good test scores, and mom felt like the plan was back on track. Step one, graduate from high school, check. Okay, step two, go to a great college, right? No, um, I did not go to college. But hey, that's, that's fine, we can, uh, there's gotta be something better. I, uh, clearly, I wouldn't do something so foolish as I don't know, put on eyeliner, join an emo band, and there's no way that fits into mom's plan, right? But unfortunately, that's exactly what I did. She was not pleased. Uh, her mood did not improve either when I told her that I was planning to get into a 15-passenger van with four other emo boys and spend the next three years touring across in the western US. Uh, we were gonna spend all of our time and energy and money trying to become rock stars so that we could maybe, hopefully, someday play the Warp Tour. That was the goal, right? Um, and even worse, I was about 95% sure I had scurvy because all I ate was top ramen. And yet, all that, all of that wandering off the plan, 20 years later, I'm here, right? And for some, Thank you, Angie. <laughs> For some definitions of the word, I'm successful. And despite everything, my mom's still pretty proud of me. <laughs> so, according to the standard plan that was laid out for me, I did every single thing wrong. Didn't follow any of the plan. And so that raises the question, how am I here? If I didn't follow the plan, how did I build a career that feels successful despite performing what my mother would describe as active sabotage on my future? I'm, I'm not gonna go into the specifics of how I made my way to where I am today from, from where I was. Uh, if you wanna talk about that, I will be I'll be around. You can come find me. I'm happy to talk about it over a beverage later. So instead, what I wanna talk about are two ways of interacting with the world that I think led me to where I am today. I wanna to talk about seeking and wandering. So let's start with seeking. Seeking is the active pursuit of a well-defined goal, right? This is planning, it's preparation, it's deliberate practice. Seeking is how we become not just competent, but great. So one of my favorite stories of seeking is the Polgar sisters. Lazlo Polgar uh, is a hobbyist chess player at best, but he wanted to set out to prove that talent is not born. Talent is learned and earned. So he had three daughters. He taught all of them to play chess starting when they were around five. And it turned into this fun family activity. It was a way that they stayed engaged and hung out together. They practiced deliberately, constantly. And the results are really hard to refute. Susan Polgar, was a top-rated player worldwide by age 14. Sophia Polgar gave the fifth greatest chess performance of all time, according to whatever metrics chess people use to measure those sorts of things. And Judith Polgar was the youngest ever chess grandmaster. All of this taught by a hobbyist chess player who wanted to set out to show that deliberate practice wins out over any sort of born talent. So Lazel wrote, people for some reason do not want to believe it. They seem to think that excellence is only open to others, not themselves. All three of these women excelled by actively seeking a goal and doing the work to get there. 
And I think we all believe that doing the work and practicing is what creates greatness, but I still think people tend to reject the idea that they could become great. We think that's for other people. So there are a lot of reasons that people might choose to deny their own capabilities, not least of which is the tendency that each of us has to believe that we are the exception that proves the rule. Uh, but I also think that many of us haven't found something that we feel is worth seeking yet. And that's because seeking is limited to the things that we can already see. You can't call a shot if you can't see it, right? So if we don't know what our options are, we can't choose one that's worth working toward. And that brings us to the second way of interacting with the world, wandering. Wandering is undirected exploration. Wandering is taking the time to look around, to find something unexpected, to realize that there are things we never considered before. Wandering is giving ourselves the space to notice that what we may have missed while we were seeking is out there, even if we didn't see it before. Wandering happens when we choose to be still, when we give ourselves enough time to be bored. We need to let our subconscious go to work on finding unexpected connections. Wandering also happens when we play. If you watch a kid with a Lego set, they very rarely follow those instructions. They were supposed to build a Millennium Falcon, but instead, they just built a really tall tower of bricks, right? And they're having a blast, and they're thinking about how things fit together, and they're learning how things connect. That gives them more ideas. It gives them a broader worldview. Wandering can also happen through reading, podcasts, videos, other forms of learning and entertainment, especially when it takes us out of our area of expertise. In all of its forms, Wandering helps us discover new pathways that were previously hidden, and it broadens our horizons and provides us with new options. Both seeking and wandering helped me get to where I am today. Through wandering, I was able to discover things like design and coding that I find fun and challenging, right? And through seeking, I was able to practice and refine those skills and turn them into a career. Through more wandering, I was able to realize that there were things like developer education, speaking at conferences, doing this whatever the heck it is I do for a living. And all of that were things I wasn't aware of when I first got into engineering. So I've needed both seeking and wandering and in fairly equal measure to get to where I am today. I often talk about this concept as in the form of play. I really believe in making things fun because I think if you find a way to practice and learn that's enjoyable, it makes it easier to push through the hard parts. Learning can be a slog because you usually can see what you want to do and you don't have enough talent yet to cross that gap and get there. So if you're doing something that you enjoy, then the practice itself is enjoyable and you're not suffering to try to get to this trophy at the end. So people are also drawn to things that make us smile which makes it easier for us to share and for people to notice, right? If we're having fun, people want to have fun with us, which can help us with building more connections, getting people to share the work that we're excited about. One of the all-time greats of this is Lynn Fisher. Uh, if you're not familiar with Lynn Fisher's work, please go check her out, she's incredible. Every year, Lynn tackles fun and creative projects in a way that let her both play and practice. This is a screenshot of, uh, of something that she calls Divtober and she creates a series of code pens. Each of these is a single div, and she's doing this as pure CSS. This is a single div, pure CSS art, one thing per day for the entire month of October. It's incredible. Lynn never sits down and thinks, should I do this? She just looks at something that's fun, that will make her happy, it'll challenge her, and she goes out and she does it. And what I love about this is that you can tell Lynn has a growth mindset. She believes that she can improve and learn, and that if she tries something and it doesn't work out, that just means she knows what not to try next time. The opposite of this is when you get stuck in a fixed mindset. And so the fixed mindset is the idea that someone like me couldn't possibly do a thing like that. When we say it, it feels true. You feel like I'm the type of, you know, I'm not that type of person, I don't do that sort of thing. But what's really happening is we're avoiding chance of failure by refusing to play at all. That's a bummer, because that refusal to play becomes a cage that we've built for ourselves. And we shut ourselves 
out, we shut ourselves down in order to avoid the fear and discomfort of being bad at something. We don't want to open ourselves up to the possibility of getting it wrong. But here's the thing about failure. Failure is an illusion. When we try things and they don't work out, it's not the end. We get another try. I'll do a quick caveat here. This doesn't apply to squirrel suit diving or motorcycle stunts or juggling chainsaws, just in case any lawyers are out here. Um, but each attempt to try something new gives us new information that'll let us do a better job next time, which means that this is practice, not failure. And every time we try, even if we don't succeed, we learn, we improve, and we watch ourselves learn and improve. We get practice at practicing, right? And so that means that trying and learning and improving becomes a pattern of behavior that's self-reinforcing, that's resilience. That means that we believe that we can do something, that we can improve, that we can get better. And every single rep we get at trying and learning and improving makes the next try easier. That is such a superpower. So another thing that I hear pushback on is that people will say, they wanna guarantee, they wanna know, what if I'm already behind? Everybody's already learned so much more than me. Everybody already knows so much more. If I choose the wrong thing, if I make a mistake, I've wasted so much time that I could have been spent seeking the thing that is good for me, that's healthy for me, right? We don't wanna waste time. And that's because of this perception. We have this fear that if all the time we spent on the old thing is no longer being done, if we're not doing the old thing anymore, then when we move over to the new thing, we've wasted all of that time that we spent on the old thing, and we're starting from scratch with the new thing. I, I think this can manifest in two really bad ways. One is, it can cause us to stick with something way longer than we should have. It can cause us to believe that, you know what, I've come this far, and starting over sounds too hard, so I'll just suffer through this until, I don't know, retirement, death? I don't know, right? Or, it results in never following through that initial learning curve and quitting early, because when you fail to get that very early success, you think, mm, okay, this isn't working out, I'm not getting the results I needed, I need to try something new. And that's the perception, but it's not reality. Reality is that a huge amount of what we're doing includes transferable skills, whether that's realizing that booking a tour and organizing street teams in cities that I'd never been to wasn't really all that different from doing client work as a web developer, uh, whether that's my partner Marissa realizing that everything she learned about talking to people when she worked in human resources would be a huge benefit when she made a career transition into design research, um, or whether that's Sarah Drasner who's coming up next, applying lessons from each of her seemingly infinite list of past jobs uh, into, career, into engineering management and creating this body of knowledge and skill that she literally ended up writing the book on it, right? Um, and so gaining experience, even if it feels completely unrelated, broadens our perspective. It's a form of wandering. It's letting us see more, right? And so here's the way I like to think about this. Imagine a room with two doors. In this room, if you go through one of the doors, there's a new room that has more doors in it. And sometimes there's a prize in that room. You are allowed to open as many doors as you want, and you get to keep all the prizes that you find. So what reason would we have to not open as many doors as possible? But people still refuse, right? Maybe they're worried that a, a door will get slammed in their face. Maybe uh, they're, they're worried that they've already got a perfectly good room, why would they waste time going looking for other rooms, right? But wandering, the learning and the exploring, it helps us see more of what's available to us. We're exposed to new possibilities, new knowledge, and the broader our field of view becomes, the more opportunities we get to make new connections. The idea, the idea of new discovery unlocking new possibility is, is called the adjacent possible. It's the idea that we can't imagine something until we've become aware of its component parts. We needed to invent written language before we could invent the printing press. We needed to invent the internet before we could start rickrolling our friends. My favorite example though, which will come as no surprise to people who follow me on Twitter, is food. Cooking food, specifically. Way back on the evolutionary chain, our ancestors realized 
that food tasted better if you lit it on fire for a bit first. There was no plan, there was no goal. They just walked up and they saw that something had like, I don't know, been sitting near a forest fire and they were like, dang, this tastes better. But an unexpected bonus of discovering cooking, it turns out digesting food uses a huge amount of energy if it is raw. Cooked food uses a lot less energy. So when we started eating cooked food, we had this surplus of energy left. And we were able to use that to grow these big old brains that make humans human. So the adjacent possible of learning to cook food was the capacity for abstract thought, right? There's no way that could have been predicted. Nobody sat, no, you know, there was no like pre-homo sapien out there in the forest going, you know, if I have a good strategy, I can develop abstract thought by cooking this food. No, they were like, this tastes great, and then they got smarter. So we need to keep seeking. We need to keep practicing, keep striving for excellence. And we need to keep wandering. We need to keep exploring, keep playing. We need both, and we need balance. So make sure that, remember to put in the work. Doing anything meaningful is gonna require dedication, perseverance, and a whole lot of effort. But we can't get so focused on that goal that we refuse to give ourselves permission to slow down, relax, look around at what else is going on. And we need to stay curious. We need to continually learn new things and explore new possibilities. But remember that learning without action doesn't take us very far. So don't use wandering as a tool to enable procrastination. And above all, remember, if a doofus like me can do everything wrong, including this hairstyle, and completely fail to follow the plan, but through a combination of seeking and wandering, is still able to end up here, doing all right, then you can absolutely do the same. So let's all go and have fun learning something new. Thank you so much. So our collective Understanding of innovation is wrong. It may seem at first like innovations are introduced by a single point of light, a lone person having a eureka moment. However, we can see that for any major innovation, this is just simply not the case. For instance, let's take the story of who invented the computer. It may at first seem linear, like a single event and implementation was the start. However, it was not one but many steps forward. Maybe under certain definitions, it was the ENIAC, widely regarded as the first electronic general purpose digital computer. There were other computers that had these features, but the ENIAC had all of them in one place. But that said, it wasn't binary. Colossus is also regarded as one of the world's first programmable digital computers, although it was programmed by switches and plugs. Binary being pretty important, maybe we want to trace it back to Aiken's Mark I, but it wasn't electronic. Or, however, Z3 and Z4 were the first programmable computers. Atnasoff and Barry designed the first time a computer was able to store information on its main memory. But none of those would be possible without uh, Claude Shannon and Turing evolving theory. But none of this would have been possible without Jacquard's loom or Babbage, who created mechanical calculators or Ada Lovelace, who invented the concepts of modern computers. She thought about how abstract anything, not just numbers, could actually be something that a computer processes and uses, and actually invented software programming. But then it really does depend on your definition of a computer, right? Because maybe you're talking about the computer chip. The computer chip is a ma major part in innovation of a computer, but didn't come until way later. Or what about the first prototype of a GUI and mouse? And really, what would modern computing be without the development with e of Ethernet to connect multiple computers and hardware? As Matt Ridley says in How Innovation Works, the invention of a computer can no more be pinpointed into a single point than you can pinpoint the moment someone, a child, becomes an adult. For even with all of these pieces, it's not just one trajectory that these innovations were made. Some were theoretical, some were hardware, some were software, and different types of innovation pushed this concept forward. And thus, what we see is that innovation is a system. It's a series 
of interconnected frequencies. Innovation is connections. Innovation is a network. Yet many people talk about innovation as a single point of light, a light bulb turning on, an aha moment that strikes only the most brilliant of all creators. But even the light bulb was invented simultaneously by 21 different people in different parts of the world. Edison might have gotten that final patent over the line, but the invention of the light bulb was slow, cumulative, and inevitable. Innovation is not a singular eureka moment. So what does it take to make something new and useful out of things that existed before? How do we create a seismic shift out of things that existed? We often talk about the waves of JavaScript frameworks and other areas of open source, the single moment in time where a framework hits massive relevance. But we don't talk about what makes a wave. Waves aren't created on their own. They are created by a force of nature, the wind. And so today, as we talk about innovation in the industry and in open source, we're gonna talk about the wind and the waves. I'm Sarah Drasner. Anyway, so who am I to talk about all of this stuff? Back in the day, I was a React developer. I keynoted React uh, Rally and then some other React conferences. And then I became enamored with Vue and I got really active in open source in the Vue community and was asked to become a Vue core team member. Then in September of last year, I took a job at, as director of engineering at Google where I run web infrastructure. So that includes, but isn't limited to JavaScript and TypeScript languages and libraries, SAS and CSS, web testing including Karma, and a few frameworks, one of which is Angular. I don't personally run the Angular team. You can think of me more like Angular's grandma. <laughs> but I did get involved in all of these open source communities from different points of view. And so today I'm gonna focus a little bit on Angular, but no, I could still tell this story from the perspective of focus of any number of frameworks, as the point is that we all learn from each other. However, I do think what's unique and intriguing about Angular is how it stood the test of time. It's shaped and influenced multiple JavaScript waves in ways that I think people don't fully realize. And it in, in turn, it learns and grows from, and is continuing to grow from those around it. So basically when I see other frameworks thriving, I really feel happy for them too. Which leads me to how do we get here? And how did Angular play a part? Now, in order to see where we're going, we're gonna glance back at the past, at what I mean by JavaScript framework waves. Uh, but I'll warn you, this is a contentious area, so folks might not agree on all of these points. So remember how I said that innovation was more like a network or a system than a single aha moment? Remember how I said that Angular stood the test of time? None of these frameworks were made from thin air. So we have all of these different waves and even precursors between them. So in the precursor section, that's not what I would define as a modern JavaScript framework, but they did influence each other and also the JavaScript frameworks. So from here, we have AngularJS, uh, which was the first version of AngularJS, which was inspired, inspired by Rails in terms of MVC approaches and also jQuery for some of the way that it manipulated the DOM. And then from there, we have Ember also in this first wave, drawing inspiration from Rails as well, and Handlebars, which Yehuda Katz, who was a BDFL for this project, worked on previously, and AngularJS spa capabilities. Then we have Backbone, Angular learned from Backbone, and Backbone learned from Angular, and also Rails MVC approaches. And Knockout learned from Handlebars and jQuery, introducing important concepts like computed properties. In the second wave, we have React, drawing from AngularJS, but dropping the M and the C out to focus on the Vue layer only. It was inspired by Backbone and also Redux, which was heavily used in the first version of React, where state management was inspired by Elm. The second version of Angular obviously drew inspiration from the first, but also from React. And Vue drew influence from literally everywhere. <laughs> um, so we, you know, have uh, computed properties from Knockout and uh, v, you know, view approaches from MVC uh, from React, and we have um, a lot of the different HTML bindings from AngularJS. And then Svelte simplified much of what came before it, uh, but actually started leaning more heavily into the compiler, which everyone is starting to get really excited and inspired from. So you'll notice I haven't told you my bets for this third stage, because I'm not a weatherman. <laughs> I will note that meta frameworks like Next and Nuxt have really picked up steam 
um, and they've become quite popular. SolidJS is doing really interesting things in the space that a lot of people are kind of learning from and growing. And um, lastly, I will say, it is kind of impressive that Angular survived multiple waves. So some of the things that you might not realize that Angular developed because, you know, the waves of, in the sands of time tend to erase these things is our spas, first class usage of TypeScript, test integration in Harness, tree shaking, ahead of time compilation, first compile time built in internationalization, and mature CLI driven updates. So that said, Angular doesn't stay still or sit alone. So one of the things I've noted when I, in the time that I've spent with this team is how humble, curious, and eager to improve the team is. So Angular is currently inspired by Svelte's authoring simplicity, Vue's approach to SFCs, Svelte stores and simplified state management, Solid's reactivity, React's unidi unidirectional data flow, Vue's animations, and Aurora or Next.js's image component. So before we even go further about what's coming next, I wanna talk about yesterday for just a second. You may have noticed if you're paying attention to JavaScript communities, the Angular's external feature set halted for a few years. Calling into question by many, did Angular stall out? Well, actually, the team paused in many features due to Ivy. Ivy was a massive ground up rewrite of Angular's renderer. Ivy was an exploration into how to build the framework that can evolve in, over time that was shipped in the last year. So you can liken this update to many of you React OGs might remember Fiber. Uh, React Fiber was a changes to the reconciliation algorithm under the hood, and also Vue recently did an update called Vue 3, which was rewritten in TypeScript and a whole rewrite of the reactivity system. So it is common for frameworks to do this kind of pausing, as Jason said, and kind of reimagining what their code base looks like from the ground up. These under these, the hood rewrites have massive gains, but they have a trade-off that some of the work on the framework slows for a time. However, Ivy also brought with it great improvements. Improved code base organization, better integration with IDs like VS code, significant speed improvements, and improved compilation errors. So that brings us to today. Now that those updates are done, Angular is evolving. And we are focusing on two major themes, advanced features and simplification of development. In terms of in advanced features, Angular's been kind of ahead of its time in terms of updates and migrations, especially having worked on other frameworks, because it had to, because it supports, it is the number one most used framework within Google. Uh, so some of that, those CLI updates had to exist in order to do the large scale changes that are required to keep up Google's infrastructure. So let's dive into some of these key features. Let's say you're working along something, you're trying to debug something, now when you get an expressive, uh, expression changed after it was checked, you get a URL to angular.io for just the section so that you can learn more about that error. We now have runtime error codes. These error codes make finding references on how to resolve any errors you may encounter really easy. This also allows the build optimizer to tree shake these error messages into production bundles. Also due to the fact that Angular runs at that scale that I mentioned, the upgrade functionality is very, very good. So we have ng update to transform a code base seamlessly, providing sophisticated error logs and reporting along the way. This means that Angular can continuously improve over time with smaller risk to users. Angular did learn from a breakage mistake between AngularJS and Angular, which is often the case when uh, uh, upgrades are backwards compatible. We have now uh, created enhanced template di diagnostics, which great, give great error detection, especially for common instances. For instance, one here is a binding error that we affectionately call the banana in a box because bananas are arguably the funniest fruit. Um, <laughs> and other error messages include nullish coalescing error, tree shakeables, error messages, and Angular CLI also now offers autocomplete functionality as well, which keeps developers in the flow of their work. So in terms of other you know, advanced features, we have strictly typed forms. Uh, one of Angular's nice features is built-in form validation. You don't have to add any other library. You can see how easily I write and build in reactive form validation in only a few lines of code and no external library or setup. However, in the, the previous versions of Angular, even if I wrote this validation, the type was cast to any. Now, that's a shame given the strength of TypeScript for this kind of validation. This was actually one of the most requested features on the GitHub repo. You can see almost a thousand thumbs up 
on this issue. Oh no. <laughs> but have no fear. In Angular v14, we added a feature that's both something that should have been improved and something way ahead. Angular already has built-in form validation, and now we leverage our first-class usage of TypeScript for strongly typed forms and validations as well. It is Angular's most requested feature, now shipped in v14. And that brings to the next sub subject, simplification of development. We're undergoing a massive movement to improve the developer experience of Angular, reduction of boilerplate, and making it easier to use. So an example of this is standalone components, which makes ng modules optional. What does that mean? <laughs> uh, a lot of you might not be Angular developers, so you maybe don't, don't understand what ng modules are, but I'll show, break it down for you really quickly. Here's an example of a lazy loading component. Previously, in an ng module, we would have written our imports. We can get on to writing our roots and our routing configuration, which would go here. So today, we remove a ton of that configuration. So we can actually go from this to this. And this is just the first step. Angular is going through massive rewrites to simplify what people need to write in order to show the intention of the code that they need to produce. And that is something that we are continually learning and building on. So in terms of the future, after the Ivy migration, this year has been an avalanche of these quality of life features and these improvements are just beginning. In 2023, Angular is tackling large developer experience gaps rewriting a reactivity system. And what I presented today is just the tip of the iceberg and what's under development for future strides. So that's really exciting for the years to come. Also, I mentioned that this team is humble and hardworking. They do have a really large GitHub repo. Aside from that, the core team has grown, which has en enabled the team to hand hammer down on technical debt. And this humble and hardworking team is really proud of some of the work that they've done. Taking 650 PRs down to un under 100 is a huge, massive improvement and also pay down of technical debt. So coming up, you'll see a lot of great improvements, many of which I've mentioned before. Uh, sim some of these are inspired by some of the other frameworks. Easier and simplified API and inspired by Vue and Solid and Svelte. Improved performance um, and, react uh, and update of the reactivity system. Um, improve, improved performance that works with Core Web Vitals and the Chrome team. Better hydration for uh, server-side rendering. Better stack traces. Better accessibility and better ARIA primitives. And a documentation revamp. Angular both pushes the web framework ecosystem forward and is also inspired by those around it. And this is how we all evolve. It is never in isolation. It is by learning from one another. Thank you.